Well, today I'm here to tell the coral reef story, one which I've been involved in over the past 20 years. And the coral reefs comprise of an ecosystem which is critically important to hundreds of millions of people, but which is, like many other natural ecosystems, highly vulnerable to local and global changes from overfishing to climate change. They've also been likened to the canary that miners of old used to take down coal mines to detect deadly gases. And while this canary procedure may have worked well in coal mines, our canary happens to be a global sentinel to the appearance of dangerous conditions on our planet. And I guess that's a place which, in contrast to the miners, it's impossible to run if our atmosphere, biology and oceans turn sour. In the next 20 minutes, I want to do three things. Firstly, I want to paint a picture of what is at stake when it comes to coral reefs. Secondly, I want to give a brief picture of the key local and global stresses to coral reefs. And lastly, I want to address the fact that the future is looking fairly catastrophic for coral reefs unless we take urgent and deep action. And I want to discuss uh, what one needs to do if we are going to preserve coral reefs on this planet. Coral reefs are peculiar for a number of reasons. Firstly, while they only occupy 0.1% of the Earth's surface, they are the richest biological habitats within the world's oceans. Estimates of the biological diversity of coral reefs put the number of species somewhere between 1 and 9 million species. And consequently, from a purely biological perspective, coral reefs are extremely important to the heritage of our planet. Secondly, Coral reefs are critically important to the stability of tropical coastlines. They are often the only barrier to the impact of waves upon otherwise vulnerable coastal areas. And lastly, coral reefs provide food and income to a very large number of people that live along the coastlines of the tropical regions of the world. And estimates of the number of people that are directly or indirectly supported by reefs run somewhere between 100 and 500 million people. It's basically up to about one in every ten people that receives benefits from coral reefs. Well, unfortunately, despite their importance, the distribution and abundance of coral reefs appear to be contracting across most of the world. These data come from a meta-survey done by John Bruno and Liz Selig, who analysed 6,000 coral reef studies across Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific since the 1950s. What they found was uniform and alarming. In almost every region they looked, the amount of coral cover in the past was a lot more than is being reported today. Naturally, meta-studies have their problem, but the overall consistency of the downward trend certainly provides reason for concern. Other studies, such as a recent update by the World Resources Institute study on reefs at risk, found that 75% of the world's coral reefs are currently threatened by local and global pressures. Careful scientific and geographic analysis reveals that the major drivers of change in coral reefs are as declining water quality due to the unsustainable management of coastlines, agriculture and river catchments is one of those. Overfishing, the removal of ecologically important groups such as grazing fishes, has resulted in the tipping of ecological balance on coral reefs towards macroalgae and other non-calcifying organisms. Coastal development, the expansion of ports and urban centres has led to the destruction of linked ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrasses and coral reefs. And this has resulted in the direct loss of coral reefs from many parts of the world. And finally, climate change, principally changes in sea temperature and alkalinity are driving shifts in the ecological and carbon balance of reef systems. The key point about many of these factors that are driving rapid change is that most of the changes will be irreversible in the timescale of human lives and livelihoods. I want to now focus in on climate change and its impacts on coral reefs and this is an issue that I've been looking at for the last two decades and one which has grown from a long-term possible threat to one which is far greater and nearer in time than we had at first anticipated. This part of the story begins in the late 1970s when coral reefs around the planet began to exhibit a phenomenon known as mass coral bleaching. 
Mass coral bleaching arises when the symbiosis between corals and dinoflagellates breaks down. This can occur due to a large range of stresses, hot and cold temperatures, low and high light, reduced salinity and pollution. The net effect of the breakdown of the symbiosis is that the brown dinoflagellates leave the tissues of, co of corals, turning them a brilliant white, and hence the term bleaching. Under normal circumstances, bleaching may occur at a colony or a patch of reef scale. But starting in 1979, however, coral reefs across entire reef systems began to bleach almost simultaneously. And what is of great interest is that evidence of similar events prior to 1979 is entirely missing from the scientific literature. Well, after a decade of research, it's become clear that these mass coral bleaching events are being driven by short periods of anomalously high sea temperatures. And since the early 1980s, mass coral bleachings have been increasing in frequency and severity. In 2005, coral reefs across large parts of the Caribbean Sea bleached and died. And coinciding with exceptionally warm sea temperatures in 2010, coral reefs across large parts of Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean and the Middle East began to bleach. And according to some biologists who studied the events in Southeast Asia, this was the worst period of mass coral bleaching so far. One of the key observations that's arisen from the past several decades of mass coral bleaching is that corals within a region will bleach when sea temperatures get to one degree Celsius or more above the long-term summer uh, maxima for periods of four to six weeks. And that stress events that are hotter for longer result in greater impacts. Multiplying the size of an anomaly by the exposure time, sometimes referred to as heat accumulation or degree heating weeks, has led to a successful satellite uh, prediction program run by Coral Reef Watch at NOAA in Washington, D.C. This program has allowed a fair degree of predictive capability with respect to what happens to a reef when heated up by a certain amount over uh, a certain period of time. The right-hand graphic shows the rough relationship between degree heating weeks, DHWs, and the amount of mortality and uh, bleaching uh, that occurred in Caribbean reefs in the 2000 uh, event. And as you see, there's quite a strong relationship between the impacts and the satellite measurements. Now, this thermal behaviour of coral populations and coral reefs has allowed us some ability to look to the future to see how coral reefs might handle the changes in sea temperature that are being predicted for the tropics under climate change. This is a fairly simple approach which compares the known thresholds for coral bleaching and mortality with projections of how sea temperatures are likely to change when atmospheric carbon dioxide levels double. As you see, the threshold above which coral bleaching and mortality occurs is breached every year by 2030 to 2050 depending on the site in the ocean being examined. Other studies have confirmed these conclusions and have added observations about which parts of the world might be more or less vulnerable. But taken together, these studies indicate that even modest increases in sea temperature represent a serious challenge to corals and the reefs they build. One of the challenges to these conclusions has been based on the notion that reef building corals might be able to evolve rapidly and hence change their thermal thresholds over time. If this were possible, then rising sea temperatures as a result of global climate change would be less of a problem because corals would be able to keep up with the changes in sea temperature. However, against the idea of turbocharged evolution is the fact that reef building corals have relatively long generation times have a lot of asexual reproduction in their life cycles and often exist in low diversity populations. All of these observations of which would suggest that evolution is likely to be slow as opposed to fast when it comes to reef building corals. To put it in a nutshell, corals are not bacteria or even drosophila and so their ability to evolve unusually rapidly is highly questionable at best. And to date, there hasn't been a single and ambiguous study that shows the evolution of coral species in terms of thermal stress in response to rapidly warming seas. And the very fact that 
the thermal threshold of corals used by the NOAA satellite program to detect and predict bleaching over the past several decades still works, suggests that significant evolution of the thermal threshold of corals has not occurred at the decadal timescale that it's required. I should point out at this stage that the observations of shifting gene frequencies within coral populations as a result of extensive mortality is not evidence of macroevolution or testament to the fact that corals can keep up evolutionarily with rapidly rising sea temperatures. Ultimately, the question that must be put front and centre is whether or not corals today within a population can sustain an increase in sea temperature of 2 to 4 degrees, or whether mutation and other processes will supply new adaptations into that population that will allow, allow corals to survive changes in sea temperature that dwarf anything seen over the past many thousands of years. Another idea which entered the literature about 20 years ago was the idea that corals may be able to change their thermal tolerances by simply changing the genetic varieties of symbiodinium that they associate with. This idea depends on two key assumptions. That the thermal behaviour of corals is totally dependent on symbiodinium and that their own thermal tolerance uh, is irrelevant. And that the symbiosis between corals and symbiodinium is flexible enough in ecological time so as to allow them to change their symbionts to suit the new temperature regimes that are arising on a decadal time scale. At this point, both of these assumptions have not been supported by sci the scientific literature. Firstly, there is now ample evidence that, perhaps not surprisingly, that corals are also highly sensitive to temperature and that their thermal behaviour is not dependent solely on the type of symbiodinium within their tissues. And secondly, the symbiosis between corals and symbiodinium is the result of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, of coevolution between one cell that has evolved to live inside another. Now, the problem of living inside another cell is not trivial. One has only to think of the problems that need to be over overcome for this to occur. A successful endosymbiont, for example, needs to overcome the issues of self-self recognition, the immune system, it has to avoid digestion by the host cell, it has to metabolically integrate and undergo and solve a large number of other problems before that integration, that endosymbiosis can occur. And for this reason, it's unlikely that corals and symbiodinium are totally flexible in terms of their symbiosis in ecological time frames of a few years and decades. In keeping with this, there is not a single study that shows a switch in ecological time from one variety of symbiodinium to a completely new variety that allows corals to live at a higher temperature. Before I leave this topic, I want to make one additional comment. This is the fact that the evolution of tolerance in corals and the persistence of coral species in time is not enough to argue that coral reefs are not vulnerable to climate change. Much of the recent literature in response to the proposed trajectories of coral reefs under global climate change have focused on the question, will coral species survive rapid climate change? And the answer to this question is that many species, but not all as pointed out recently by Charles Shepard and others, are likely to survive rapid climate change. This question, of course, dodges the much more important issue of whether or not coral reefs will survive so that they continue to provide the enormous services to human beings throughout the tropical regions of the world. That is, the persistence of rare populations of corals does not mean that productive carbonate coral reef ecosystems will continue to survive in our changing world. Unfortunately, there is growing evidence of other changes that are being driven by the atmosphere that are of relevance to coral reefs. One of these is ocean acidification. Unfortunately, there is growing evidence that changes to the composition of the atmosphere not only impact coral reefs through the associated increases in sea temperature. Recent and projected changes in the chemistry of the world's oceans suggest that reef building corals will struggle to produce their carbonate skeletons. Ocean acidification arises from an increased entry of carbon dioxide into the world's oceans 
where it combines with water to create a dilute acid. These changes are then causing a global decline in ocean pH and carbon and ion concentration. And these are measurable changes that we know are happening. And most of the evidence, which will be reviewed by a later talk in this workshop, indicates that calcifiers like reef building corals are depositing much less calcium carbonate and their fundamental biochemistry is changing as a result of decreasing pH conditions. Now one of the important issues within all of this is the potential interaction that may occur between sea temperature and ocean acidity. We recently published a study in which we looked at the interaction between elevated sea temperature and changes in ocean acidification. The major conclusion from this study, which looked at both corals and calcareous algae, was that changes in temperature and acidity are not independent and interact in important ways. One of our observations was that corals in more acidic conditions will bleach at much lower sea temperatures. Placed in the context of how coral reefs will change over the coming decades and century, this important interaction suggests that our current trajectories are overly optimistic as opposed to pessimistic with respect to how the frequency and intensity of mass coral bleaching is likely to change as sea temperatures change. There is also some compelling evidence from the field. In a study of over 300 coral cores by the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences led by Glenn Diath, the deposition of calcium carbonate by long-lived corals was observed to drop by 14% since 1990 across the entire Great Barrier Reef. Perhaps the most compelling part of this story was that a similar decline in calcification was not seen anywhere else in the 400 years of record examined. While it is not possible in the DR study to attribute the decline in calcification solely to ocean acidification, these changes were consistent with the idea that changing sea temperatures and acidity are already beginning to impact the ability of reef building corals to maintain the carbonate structures that are so important to the biodiversity and productivity of coral reef ecosystems. The fact that we are already seeing major changes after only modest changes in greenhouse gas concentrations in the planet's atmosphere should serve as a major warning of the types of changes that are likely to occur along the current pathway towards much higher concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. I want to now turn to the third section of my talk which concerns the future of coral reefs and how we should be responding if we are to preserve these important tropical ecosystems. There is considerable evidence that concentrations of carbon dioxide that increase above 450 parts per million will be associated with the complete demise of carbonate reef systems within tropical waters. Now time doesn't permit within this talk to review this evidence. Needless to say, it's been collected together in a number of reviews, including one which I wrote with a large number of individuals uh, and published in Science in 2007. This set of images from our article helps summarise the potential future scenarios for coral reefs. If we take today, for example, on the left-hand side, we're dealing with periodic impacts where many reefs are in a good position to recover. However, if we continue with another 30 years of elevated emissions, we get to a point where we begin to exceed atmospheric CO2 levels of 450 parts per million and sea temperatures greater than 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial value. At this point, coral populations are likely to be less competitive relative to other organisms, such as non-calcifying, non-symbiotic organisms such as seaweed, sponges, and a whole range of other organisms. And as a consequence, an increasing number of coral-dominated reefs will be transformed into ecosystems dominated by other organisms. And if we continue along the same trajectory for another 30 years, we'll see situations in which most organisms that we know of as reef dwellers today will be struggling to exist. The loss of reef calcifiers will mean that the three-dimensional structure of coral reefs will begin to break down, resulting in a scenario like that shown in the right-hand panel. The important issue, however, is how much we must reduce CO2 emissions in order to avoid breaching the guardrail of 450 parts per million and 2 degrees Celsius.
A group from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change Adaptation Research, led by Malta Meinshausen, has done the critical study. The results of this comprehensive analysis of models, emission pathways and outcomes for the atmosphere and planet reveals that we have 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide less to release into the atmosphere starting in year 2000. Given that we've already emitted somewhere around 270 gigatons of carbon dioxide since 2000 already, this number is probably already around 700 gigatons of carbon dioxide left. Meinshausen and his team explores the all-important question of how quickly we must reduce global emissions if we are to have at least a 60% chance, from their study, of staying below 450 parts per million and a 2 degree Celsius increase in temperature. This leads to the following series of curves which show how quickly global emissions need to be reduced if we are to have a chance of avoiding breaching the guardrail. The later we start, the steeper the curve and the more expensive the options are in the transition pathway. As you'll see here, if we start today, we need to reduce emissions on an average rate of 3.7% per year. If we delay by four more years, this rate needs to come up to 5.3% per year and so on. One reality can be distilled from the preceding discussion and this is that there is no use in doing anything if we don't immediately act on global emissions. No amount of protecting fish stocks, solving coastal land degradation or redesigning coastal urban environments will have any effect on the outcome. We will simply lose coral reefs and that will be that. But assuming we do get to a point where emissions are rapidly brought under control and the world's atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations stabilise at or below 450 parts per million, our attempt to solve local issues will become more, not less important. There is now abundant evidence that reducing stresses from local factors such as overfishing and declining water quality can have a major positive impact on how quickly coral reefs will recover from impacts arising from global stresses such as rising sea temperatures and acidities. This emphasises the importance of synergies between local and global factors which represent a tremendous opportunity to buy important time as the world struggles to bring greenhouse gas concentrations under control. This example also suggests that we must endeavour to solve both local and global stresses, upping the ante in our efforts as we start to feel the full force of burgeoning human populations, climate change and coastal degradation. So to summarise, Coral reefs provide an extremely instructive example of the linkages between environmental change, ecosystem health and human well-being. This may be obvious to us, but the public and decision makers largely do not understand this. And I believe that examples like coral reefs should be used to try and educate people to realise how serious the current situation is. Coral reefs also highlight the complex problems associated with environmental change, where local and global factors interact synergistically or antagonistically, and that these synergies and antagonisms between factors are important and must be the focus of future study. Until recently, much of the experimental work has focused on the impacts of single variables, such as increasing sea temperature or decreasing pH, and rarely both. There is now an urgency for studies that explore realistic combinations of variables in order to understand how the world is changing and will change. Without understanding these synergies and antagonisms better, we are likely to underestimate the rate of change and make ourselves more vulnerable to global surprises, many of which we are unlikely to recover from. And lastly, at the same time as we understand the drivers and outcomes of stress, there needs to be a renewed effort to bring the increasingly dire circumstances of celebrity ecosystems such as coral reefs to the attention of people everywhere. For while it is of extreme concern that coral reef ecosystems are being rapidly extinguished by changes to the global environment, they are critically important as indicator ecosystems which highlight the enormous changes that we're making to planet Earth. So consistent with our early analogy, one can only conclude that the Earth's canary is gasping on the floor of its cage. Thank you.